every single day, every single moment, you could be saying something that's going to turn somebody's life around. We're often in the news and it's negative. There are thousands and thousands of positive stories every day. You know, it shapes who you are as a leader. Welcome to Business Minds. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ann Kelly, for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, so you were appointed Commissioner of Correctional Service of Canada on July 30th, 2018, correct? Yes, but I was interim commissioner uh, starting on February 2nd, 2018. Okay. And so can you please like describe your role and your position in just a few words to help our audience understand better? Well, for me, it's a real privilege to be the Commissioner of Corrections because I've been with CSC for 40 years okay, wow. in October. So I've done my whole career with CSC. As the Commissioner, I'm responsible for the management and administration of the various institutions we have across the country, as well as the parole offices that do the supervision of offenders in the community. Okay, and can you tell us a bit about CSC and numbers? So in terms of numbers, we are responsible for approximately, um, at this point, 13,100 offenders uh, in custody okay. and approximately 8,300 offenders under supervision in the community. Okay, thank you very much. So this interview will be focusing mainly on the notion of leadership. So to talk about this, we would like to understand where it started. So my first question is quite personal. Where did you grow up? And did you, what, what kind of job were you dreaming of becoming as in your earlier years? So I grew up in Plantagenet and Plantagenet is a Franco Ontarian township in Eastern Ontario. Okay. It's approximately an hour east of Ottawa. Okay. Well, first of all, I grew up in, in uh, Plantagenet, but when I was 12, we moved to Elmer, Quebec. Okay. And I went to an all-girls school, L'Ecole Saint-Joseph, okay. in Hall. And there, I took mostly sciences. So I took biology, chemistry, and physics. And even in my high school yearbook, it said that I wanted to be a surgeon. That was oh, my really? goal. Yes. Okay, wow. I was going to go into medicine. So I went straight from high school. I didn't do CEGEP, straight into first year university. Oh, wow, okay. So I was quite young. I had just turned 17, uh, okay. I think a couple of days before starting university. And uh, I did my undergrad actually in biology. But while I did my undergrad in biology, I took electives. And uh, actually I took psychology and sociology and developed a real interest uh, for psychology. Okay. So then uh, uh, after I finished my bachelor's in biology, I went straight into the master's program in criminology. Okay. So did that, and then I joined uh, CSC, and later on went back to school to do my executive MBA. Okay, wow. So you were dreaming to become a doctor first, but with the idea of being a surgeon, is that what you said? Yes, uh, okay. I was determined to be a surgeon. Okay, interesting. But then when I started uh, taking some courses in psychology, sociology, I thought that was really interesting. So I shifted, and then as soon as I finished the program, I was actually interviewed, and I joined CSC in 1983. Okay, wow, that's very interesting. And um, we we'll, would also like to ask you, what kind of character were you as a kid or as a teenager? Were you, like, as a wanted to be a doctor, were you someone who wanted to help others? How, how, how did you see yourself um, as a character? So in kindergarten, uh -huh. I still remember I was very responsible because I'm okay. the oldest of three girls. Uh, I was also very disciplined and quite serious. And I was selected to, I don't know if you have that now, but certainly when I was a kid, you passed out cookies and little 
um, cartons of milk. So I was selected to do that. Uh, in grade school, I got selected at the end of the year um, to say like goodbye to all the classes at Christmas, okay. to wish Christmas to the classes. So um, I was already a bit of a, a leader okay. early on. In those early years, were you able to envision yourself becoming and arriving to the point where you are right now? Did you have this kind of no. manifestation idea? No. No. I don't think I even knew what a commissioner, <laughs> deputy minister was. So even when I started in corrections, I started at Collins Bay in 1983 in Kingston. Okay. And it was really funny because when I started, the warden at the time, who was a huge man, met with me. And I was just starting, but I had heard that the head of the institutions were warden. So when I met with him, uh, he, we talked, and then he asked me, what do you see yourself doing? And I said, well, one day I'd like to be a warden. And he said, oh, so <laughs> you're aspiring to my job. Uh -huh. But I had just started, so I didn't know. But I certainly didn't understand the um, basically the org structure and that past the warden there were other people. Okay. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And um, a little a few steps backwards, uh, back in your early years. You said you wanted to be a surgeon. Were you influenced by anyone? Did you have any inspiration figures, any role model that like inspired you to, to forge these dreams on your mind? Not to be a, a surgeon because we don't have that in the family. It was more I was an avid reader and I was always interested in the human body. Okay. So that was where I got that. Okay. Very interesting. So you mentioned a bit already how your car career started. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? How did you enter CSC for the first time? So at the time I was, so I grew, I'm Francophone, uh -huh. but um, again, living in Plantagenet, I learned English early. And then what happened is when I went to university in biology, basically, all the courses were in English. Okay. So I really jumped in with two feet okay. and my English was not that good. So I got corrected a lot, but I managed to, I learned it really, really quickly because I was into it. The courses were in English. Um, then when I did the uh, master's program, I did it in French, and immediately after that, like I said, because I was bilingual, I was a woman, they were looking for people oh, okay. um, that were definitely bilingual in yeah. Kingston. So they interviewed me for a job as a parole officer, and I, I got hired. Okay. And then, and then it went from there, and I got to be a supervisor, got to be unit manager. I basically did a lot of the jobs until obviously I got this one. Okay, so yeah, we maybe we don't realize this now, but it, like at the time it must have been paramount to be bilingual. It must have been a great advantage to, to make your way. Yes, because in Kingston there were some uh, offenders that spoke French so they were always looking for people that could okay. speak both. And obviously on your caseload, you got the French speaking inmates. So it was an asset to be bilingual. Okay, yeah. I see, perfect. And so you mentioned it quickly, but what, when was the first time you had the chance to experience a leadership position? And what did it change for you? What did it change in your career? And maybe also in the way that people were looking at you? Well, when I started 40 years ago, there weren't that many women. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, what happened is I got to be a supervisor fairly quickly and then a manager. So oftentimes I was at meetings and I was the only woman around the table. So uh, that was certainly like we've come a long way 
since those days. But that was one thing. So it was er fairly early in my career that, um, like I said, I got to sit around a management table. Okay. Did you see any obstacle being the first women in this kind of situation? Or did it was it natural? For me, it was natural. I think that I knew the subject matter. Um, I was serious about what I did. So I can't say that you know, I experienced a lot of issues. Okay. So you, you've talked a lot about this responsibility that you felt. What about the maybe privilege of getting to this position? Did it make you feel any sort of pride at this moment? Or was it not the first feeling you, you had? Oh, no. I felt it was such a privilege. Like, I mean, you know, I've been with CSC now for 40 years. Um, and when I think back, like 40 years is a lot of your life. You know, I started a long time ago. And to me, to have experienced a different positions, to have worked for an organization, I truly, truly believe in our mandate, changing lives, protecting Canadians. Um, we always have to remember that the offenders at one point are going to be our neighbors your neighbor, my neighbor, our loved one's neighbors. So you want to ensure that they are better when they are released than when they came to you. So for me, uh, I've always believed in the mandate. I think that CSC has some exceptional people. Um, they are compassionate um, because, you know, we work with a segment of society that many people... Um, to some extent, would like to forget, but you can't forget because they are going to be released. So for me, it was an absolute privilege to be able to lead the organization. So you talked about people and the culture in your organization. Were there any people who had a major positive impact throughout your career? Yes, actually, there's a couple. So what marked my career is... Um, I hadn't been in the service for even a year yet. I was still on probation okay. as a parole officer. And they seconded me to actually interview people to become parole officers. Okay, wow, okay. And at the time, um, I was doing interviews, and there's this person, an administrative assistant, that came and said, the regional deputy commissioner wishes to speak with you. And the regional deputy commissioner is the person in charge of a re region. Mm -hmm. And we have five regions in CSC. Yeah. So I, it, this was Ontario. And he's passed away now, but he said to me when I met with him, he said, I don't know you, but I'm hearing some really good things about you. You'll go far in this organization. And that really marked me. It kind of gave me some... It's during your first year here? You yes. Said. Wow, okay. My first year in Kingston, I hadn't even finished probation. Wow. Yes. And the other person is, uh, he was a former commissioner, Commissioner Ingstrup, but he's the one that introduced the mission, uh, our mission of assisting and encouraging offenders while exercising safe, secure, reasonable, and humane control. And, you know, there was a time where we we kind of breathe, we lived the mission. He really made his mark with the mission of CSC, so yes. Okay, wow. So <clears throat> in the same category, I would like you to ask if you could share the most defining moments of your career, the, the, like the key moments that made you who you are now, maybe in your career-wise. Well, the motto is changing lives, protecting Canadians. So it's when you see the impact that you've had on somebody. And just, I was commissioner, it's about maybe now a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago. There's somebody that wrote to me in an email and said, um, are you are you the Ann Kelly that was a parole officer in Kingston oh. in the early 80s? And if you are, 
I just want you to know that I have never been in trouble with the law again. Um, I've remained out of prison, and it was because of the the advice and the work I did with this person. So these are the moments wow. that you say, yes, you know, and I always say to the staff that it doesn't matter. Like every single day, every single moment, you could be saying something that's going to turn somebody's life around. When you work with offenders, you never know when that is, but it could happen. And so, you know, always obviously be professional, be respectful. Um, and also you have to understand the power of words and actions. Well, that's very inspiring. Um, hard to move on from this, but yeah. <laughs> um, what are the most, you kind of, imply this in this beautiful response what are the most what are you most proud of in your career I guess we're in the same category um, just I think my journey with CSC okay you know starting I got a really good foundation as a uh, as a parole officer and then doing basically all the jobs in between the other thing is You know, I worked in many institutions in the Ontario region. I moved to Pacific twice to work. Okay. The first time in some penitentiaries. The second time I was the regional deputy commissioner. And also all the uh, wonderful people that I've met. So I'm proud of everything. And I've, I truly feel honored and privileged to, to be the commissioner. Wow. Again, quite inspiring. Um, But we know that every success comes with hardships. Did you have to face any big crisis? What will be the biggest one and how did you manage to go through? Well, certainly when you work in an institution, um, you have to realize the, the people that you're going to be interacting with. <clears throat> If they're in a penitentiary, it's for a reason. And you have to be conscious that Sometimes uh, things can turn when you're interacting with them. So I've had those incidents occur uh, over the years. But what I would say more recently would be, um, obviously we had COVID. That was a really difficult couple of years. And I think that the service fared really well. Like people truly pulled together And, and even my colleagues will say when we compare ourselves to uh, other jurisdictions, we did quite well. We didn't lose uh, very many lives. We didn't have riots like they've had in other countries. But more on a more personal level for me is during COVID, I needed to have heart surgery. And that came out of nowhere. Oh. Oh, okay. So, yes, I was told that my mitral valve didn't work correctly and I needed uh, surgery. So I had surgery during COVID and basically somebody leaves you on the sidewalk and they wheel you in and then somebody picks you up on the sidewalk because you could have no visitors. Wow. You could have nobody inside the hospital. So, wow. yeah. So, and heart surgery is pretty invasive. So that, I would say that was the... Wow, yeah, that was quite a challenge to say the least. Um, and uh, looking back now over your entire career, is there anything you think now you would have done differently? Um, you know, I think everything happens for reasons and makes you the person you are today. Uh -huh. So it's really hard to say there's probably... You grow, you mature, and you get wiser. So it's hard, you know, um, to say, well, I would change. Sense. Yeah. That makes sense, yeah. Um, and so maybe getting a little bit more technical, 
would you say um, what are the most important skills that you have acquired all throughout the different roles and positions you've held? Definitely communication skills uh -huh. and also being to able, because when I started, I was really young and, you know, sometimes I was seeing inmates that were in their 50s and they were wondering, like, what is it that I'm going to learn from you, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, wow. <laughs> so it, you certainly... Um, learn how to communicate. I mean, I, like I had studied in, in yes. that field. So uh, the other thing you learn quickly as you become a supervisor is pulling together a team. So working as a team and keeping people motivated because you can accomplish more if, if you have that team spirit. Um, so very much collaboration. Uh, I would say. How did you manage to do that over over the years? Was it was it over, always like uh, something easy for you, or? Um, I assessed the team. Like for example, I remember in one instance, uh, we did it as something fun, but everybody okay. did the um, Myers Briggs. Okay. And just to understand each other be better, if we were introvert, extroverts, judging, perceptive perceptive so and um, and we discussed it and that was good uh, in another place I had just started at that particular penitentiary and a hockey game was going on and some people were taking for the Canadians and some people were taking for the Toronto uh, the Leafs uh -huh. and so what I did is I went and got the crest for each cut them in half and sewed them together, put them on my T-shirt. And then I was hosting, uh, I was having a meeting with all my team. Okay. So, and then at the beginning of the meeting, I said, I know there's some tension, hockey game is going on and I open and they said, oh my God. So I did things like that just to, I don't know, keep the kind of team spirit you know, uh -huh. make sure it was there. So, did, yes. Did people react well? Oh, yes. Yeah. It, yes. Did, it did help with the team bonding for everyone? It did, yes. And also you have to be comfortable sometimes having difficult conversation. And, you know, you, yeah. you don't have to be um, abrasive, uh, um, abrupt, you know. I think there's a way to have them where you people come along. So I've learned a lot over my career. Perfect. All the jobs I've done, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, especially for CSC, how did you manage to balance your personal career goals, maybe climbing the ladders as you did so well, and fulfilling the mission of Correctional Service Canada? Did you have any challenging, any challenges, sorry, balancing the two, or was it always converging in the same direction? You mean my goals and the mandate? So, to me, I've... No the, the mandate was something early on that, you know, you you embrace. I think it makes okay. sense. So the two were never in conflict. They, it was always aligned. It is still today. We still talk about, you know, like I said, encouraging assisting offenders while exercising. It's the same. And it's always been that way for the 40 years I've worked with CSC. Okay. What do you think you would have done if you were not commissioner today? What would I have done? Do you have any idea? Yes. Uh, actually, this is something I wanted to do to prepare maybe at some point, you know, I'll be retiring. Okay. So I've always wanted to do my doctorate in psychology because okay. what I would do is be a psychologist. Okay. Yes. Also. From what I understand, all of the, what you've told us so far is that you really care about what's happening inside the people's minds. Am I yes. correct? Yes, absolutely. And about human behavior, thinking, absolutely, yes. I have a real interest in that. Well, that's a very good transition for my next question, which is diving a bit more into your vision on leadership. In your opinion, what makes a great manager or a great leader? 
I think you have to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to be genuine um, to gain the, uh, the trust of people. I think you have to be respectful no matter what the situation, always. You have to have some integrity. Um, and uh, like I said, and then th those are the big ones, but you also have to have good communication skills and be able to work with others. That's really important. If you can't work with others, it's pretty difficult to, to do the job, mm -hmm. so. And so all of these, did you, would you think you learned them by yourself or were they taught to you by anyone in particular? Well, definitely my, the way I was brought up. Um, okay, yeah. Yes, yes, that was certainly in the family unit. We were taught um, to be ourselves, to um, basically be respectful of people always in our words and in our actions, so yes. Okay, and did you have any mentor that kind of guided you along the way? Um, yes, so for me it would have been like when I started uh, at Collins Bay, I was people assigned to me that helped me learn the job Okay. And I always had people, like it's different people, but the where I went to, people were always very supportive and helping so that I did the best job I could. Okay. Do you remember any key learnings you got from them? Something that stuck to your mind? Um, be yourself, like know your job. That's really important. Um, and... You know, you have to work at it. Um, so th things of that nature, but it depends on the position I was in and they just helped me along. Okay, okay, perfect. Based on everything you've just said, what is your leadership style? How would you define it? Um, it always depends on the situation. Sometimes it's more democratic, sometimes it's more collaborative. Sometimes it's more consensus building, but I would say I'm very collaborative. Uh, certainly, we have uh, executive committee meetings rec regularly, and people are very free to um, make comments, okay. and I'm open to that, and I think that's where you end up with the best product. So Okay, and so now you've been commissioner for five years. Yes. So you worked with like previous commissioners before. Would you say your leadership style would be different from your predecessors? I would say we're all different. Uh -huh. And obviously you bring your own, well, your own style to it. So I would say so. Okay. Plus, I'm a woman. Yeah. The previous commissioner was a man. So... You know, there's... Different... Do you think that makes a difference in the organization? I think there's a bit of a difference, yeah, in terms of our... Um, maybe the way sometimes we view certain things. Okay. So... Do you have any examples? Um, well, you know, I come from a... Um, even in terms of the background, like uh, yeah, I started as a parole officer, yeah. um, although for me, the staff, their safety, security, that's paramount. Like, you know, you want the staff to be able to do, to be the best that they can be, so they need the proper environment. But I think where you come from, the experiences you've had for any leader, that's you know, it shapes who you are as a leader. Okay. So. Yeah, it feels like it, it can be stronger than anything else over the time. Um, so, next question. Do you believe anyone can be a leader? Slash, could anyone be a good leader, in your opinion? Um, well, on that one, um, it's difficult to say, can anyone be a leader? 
again, you have to have, um, I believe, you know, you, you have to know, know the job. You have to have certain skills. Uh, I believe you have to have certain experiences. Uh, there's certain, um, you have to be able to collaborate with people. You have to be able to communicate. I would say if you have those, those skills, uh, probably if you don't, it might be more difficult to be a leader. Still in this evaluation of uh, leadership, do you think a good leader should be judged most in regards to the people they're managing or to the people upper who they're accountable to? I think it's both, right? I report to the minister uh -huh. and obviously the, you know, who you report to is going to evaluate how you do the job. But I also think it's really important, you know, it's always a team effort. The so, yes, absolutely. Like, again, COVID is a perfect example that everybody pulled as a team. Um, I, and I mean, everybody in the organization no matter the job, no matter where they were, it, it was a team effort. So I think that's really important. Excellent. Um, now, still in, your, in the, your own perspective, can you define success, both in your professional and maybe personal life? For me, it's... Um, when you're doing something and you're happy doing it. So okay. for me, I love what I do. I have a passion for it. I believe in it. So for me, you know, in the last 40 years going to work, I was always happy to go to work because wow. I truly believe in what I do. It's the same thing in my personal life. Like I can invest myself in something. I love doing it, so I'll give it my all. And that's what I've done with CSC. Wow, quite inspiring again. Um, we're getting to the end of the interview. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received throughout your career? And do you think you would give that same advice to your 20 year old self? Best piece of advice. Um, for me, it was, you can do anything you want if you work hard, and I did. I, I worked hard, and I got to where I was. So that's always been a good piece of, my, uh, of advice. My, my dad had a, he's passed away, but really, really, really strong, strong work ethic. So do I. Um, more recently, uh, because, you know, with CSC, we're often in the news and it's negative. Okay. Unfortunately, you know, people don't realize that with uh, 22,000 offenders, 19,000 people that work for CSC, that there are thousands and thousands of positive stories every day. Um, so, but... Being in the news, sometimes it's difficult because everybody has an opinion on what we should be doing. So there's an expression that says, this too shall pass. So sometimes yeah. you just have to remember that, you know, at that moment is going to pass and you're going to move on to something else. And the other thing is always realizing that, especially here, sometimes there's crises but you have to think back okay are things good in the institution for the most part if they are like that's that's what's important and the offenders being supervised in the community yeah that's great to remember indeed and so after all this very impressive and inspiring career um what would you like to have accomplished by the end of it <laughs> what do you have left to accomplish after everything you've done already? Well, there's one thing that we've embarked on, and that's an audit of the culture of CSC. Okay. And that's big. Um, 
And uh, I, I really want to see that through. Because for me, I think CSC, again, is a fantastic organization. But, you know, can we improve the culture? Especially now that, you know, we're talking about um, anti-racism, about uh, environments that are free from harassment, discrimination, violence. So being an inclusive workplace, uh, being providing a work environment where people can be the best that they can be. So is there room for improvement? Yes. And that's what I'm looking forward to the uh, what the audit of culture is going to reveal and then um, obviously putting together an action plan so we can address some of the areas we need to address. Okay, well, that's impressive. Again, when will this audit be over? It's okay. underway right now. Okay. So we'll see uh, when the report, I would say within the next uh, year. Okay, that's great. This, this is not the first thing we would think of when we think of CSE, so that's, that's very good to know. Um, we're getting to the last couple of questions. Mm -hmm. If you could have a private meeting with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? Viktor Frankl. Oh, why? Because v Viktor Frankl was a uh, concentration camp prisoner, but uh, he wrote the book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And uh, he's also the creator of Logotherapy. Okay. But he talks a lot about um, being hopeful because when he was incarcerated, it's like he had to keep himself going. So he's a really interesting figure. He's, uh, he's, he's not alive anymore, but that would be one person that, again, because I'm interest in, interested in how people think, I'm a very positive person myself, but I would like to be able to ask him, you know, how it was, how he kept himself motivated. Wow. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. Very interesting in psychology. Thank you very much. We're getting to the end of the interview. Uh, to wrap this up, I would like to ask simply, what can we wish you for the future? Health. Actually, that's, the, a very that's good one. the that's one a, thing that's a very I've good learned one. is if you don't have your health, you basically don't have, you know, it's very difficult. So health, for sure. That's a very good one. Thank you so very much. So this was Commissioner Ann Kelly for Business Minds. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, did you find it interesting? Yes, I thought. Yeah? Yeah.